Welcome to the Jill on Money Show. It's Monday, November 4th, and we are here trying to help you go into a different direction, perhaps, with your financial life. Maybe it's the exact same thing. Maybe you just want some ears and eyes on a situation. But Mark and I are both certified financial planners, and that means that you might call us about something specific, but we actually are going to talk about some larger constructive ways that you can approach your whole self and your whole financial life. So if something is percolating, give us a shout. Just go to our website, jillonmoney.com, click the contact us button, write us a note and let us know if you would like to come on the air by checking the box. While you're on the website, don't forget to sign up for the free weekly newsletter. It comes out every Friday and Mark does a great job with that. And also, check out Jill on Money Live. That is our subscription service. For $35, you will have access to quarterly live webinars, the back catalog of those webinars, bonus content, and our next webinar is coming up just in a couple of weeks, Thursday, November 14th, 7 Eastern time. We're going to have a lot of information by then. You might have a better sense of what the tax landscape could look like in the coming years. So you'll have to join us. $35 and CFP and CPA Michael Goodman will be helping us answer your year end and tax loss harvesting questions. You can only join us if you are a member of Jill on Money Live. Ha, <sighs> got through that. Okay. So I know it's a big week and uh, we understand everyone's like on heightened anxiety levels. We are going to do a plain old conversation with one of you today. Tomorrow, we'll talk a little bit about just sort of big picture economic stuff uh, in honor of Election Day. And then we're going right back into our format, okay? Because this is not a political show. This is a show about you and your money. Today, we are talking to Yoni, who's on the line from New York. Hello, Yoni. Welcome back. Yoni's a recidivist appearer on our program. So hi, Yoni. What's going on? Hey, guys. Uh, very uh, excited to be on again uh, with you guys. I feel like uh, you guys are uh, just doing some great work out there. And I just, my, as my financial life has changed and evolved over the years, I wanted to run by some more questions with you. Great. Tell us what's um, up. How old are you? So I'm I'm 34 years old, um, and I am wondering if I am maybe being too cautious with my savings, and if perhaps I should reallocate some of my savings to uh, my like taxable investments. Mm. Am I like leaving potential gains on the table, as given you know my my long term life goals of you know investing and saving for the next 30, 40 plus years. I, I uh, like the idea of like, am I being too cautious? It's right up my alley. I am one of those people who is probably too cautious. So tell us a little bit about yourself. So are you working full time? I am working full time. And I also do some part time work and some freelance occasionally throughout the year just to supplement my income and take the edge off of having all my eggs in one employer's basket. <laughs> How much is your full time um, salary? Your like base plus bonus? Base plus bonus comes out to about 120. Okay. And are you making retirement contributions on that income? Yes. I put in a 5% Roth into a Roth 401k and my employer tops it up with 8%. Uh, wait, 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 traditional wait. Match. They put in automatically 8% in traditional? So yeah, the employer's contributions are, are pre-tax dollars, but my contributions are, are eligible for Roth. You're putting 5% into a Roth. Your employer is contributing 8%. And that's your on your $120,000. Now, you said you also have part-time and freelance income. About how much is that on an annual basis? On an annual basis, that probably brings in uh, about 30 to 35 grand in addition. And are you making any contributions on that income? Are you putting some money in a Roth IRA or doing anything else with that money? Yeah, I max out a Roth IRA as mm -hmm. well as contribute to a Roth 403B because one of the, the part-time gig is actually a teaching position at a oh. local college. Okay, great. So why don't we just go through some of the balances? Your current 401k, how much is in there? That's about 40 grand. Okay, great. And the Roth 403B? That has about 10,000 in it. And the Roth IRA? That has about 120 in it. Ooh, that's good. And do you also have a brokerage account? 
I do. Um, and there's also a traditional IRA from a rollover, oh. though I don't contribute to it at this point. And it has another 10000 in it. I have an idea about maybe how to consolidate that. Okay. And the brokerage account has how much? About 120 Wow. Are you partnered, single, married? What, what's your status? Engaged, actually. Ooh, exciting. And um, you're fi- affianced. Do you guys combine your incomes and all of your financial lives or do you keep things separate? Everything is completely separate. Okay. So we're not going to worry. I mean, just to know that you're you're going to have, I guess, of course, when you get married, what you have to understand is that you are bringing together finances. Do you think you'll be filing jointly? I don't know about that. And I, I should do more digging because my, my dad is actually in a, a CPA. So Oh, perfect. Well, good. He can help you out. Sometimes filing, when you're married and you file as individuals while you're married, sometimes it's really not great. So I would, if your dad is inclined to help out in this uh, endeavor, I think it might be worth it. It might be better for both of you to consider yourself married filing jointly. Then you would just be jointly filing for taxes. You can still keep your money separate. Do you guys live together right now or do you have separate um, residences? We officially have separate residences. Okay. And do you own or rent? We own uh, two apartments, one each in a co-op and they're right next door to each other. Oh my God, that's amazing. And are you going to sell? Are you going to combine? What's going to happen here? Well, uh, neither. We are leaving it as is. We're very, we use one as essentially uh, for guests and a, as a staging apartment, essentially, and a spare kitchen and bathroom as we need it. Um, we got very lucky with the setup. And wow. uh, we've, I mean, we've looked around about potentially selling and, you know, upgrading, but mm-hmm. I mean, the, the market in New York is just so insane. We really, mm. It would cost so much just in transactions alone that nothing we've found seems to make that going through that journey worth it. (laughs) I feel like this is why, like, is the foundation of a great relationship. Two adjoining apartments, but they are separately maintained. How much is each of those apartments worth? Um, So the one that I own has been appraised a few years ago at three sixty five. So it's got to be four. Let's just say four-ish. And what about, is there a mortgage on it? There is. There's a 30-year fixed at two and a half percent. And there's about 195000 left on it. Wow, that's great. And what about the second one? The second one is appraised, is probably, it's smaller. So it's, I don't know uh, where it lands, honestly. And it's in my fiance's name, but he also has a 30-year fixed on it. And it's at like three and a quarter or three point three two five, I think. Wow. Um, and he's le- he's got less than hundred grand on that mortgage for sure. So if so, maybe if it's worth, can we? Is it fair to say it's probably worth around three hundred? His place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that'd be all right. And so there's no, you're not going to rent it. You're just going to like hold these two as separate dwellings, living in sort of back and forth, but let's, but we're going to hold on to both of these, right? Yeah, for okay. the time being, yeah, it's not really okay. in the immediate picture to change that. So one of the things that you said when you came on the air was like, I think I have too much money saved. Do you also have like a savings checking balance that's, that's um, building up or what, what do you have in emergency reserves? So I have about 55,000 between a CDs and savings account. And there's another 20000 in those TIPS uh, savings bonds, those inflation-protected mm-hmm. ones. Mm-hmm. And then I have another – there's another 40000 in a separate brokerage account that's invested in two specific stocks, uh, one in, through uh, – that I've built up through an employee uh, – um, uh, an ESPP, Employer mm-hmm. Stock Purchase Plan, and the other uh, – just a lucky chance I was able to participate in an IPO – of a stock several years ago. And uh, so I've just been holding on to that. So those have big gains in them. Yeah. The ESPP, not so much just because it slowly accumulates and the stock hasn't, I mean, it's done well, which is is nice, but uh, the IPO did very well by comparison. Mm -hmm. And do you have any losses sitting in the $120,000 brokerage account by any chance? You know, I don't know, but that's that's something I could, I guess I should look into. Um, Um, Only because if you want to try to 
reallocate and get your um, get a little bit more of uh, efficiency in all of your managed accounts that you rather the accounts you're managing that maybe we would reallocate, take some losses, maybe take some money off the table in those two stocks. Not, I mean, not that it's the biggest deal. You could leave them alone. But if you if you felt like, oh, my God, today I would never put forty thousand dollars into these two things then it's sometimes it's it's worth it just to say, hey, do I have any losses? Did I buy some bonds at the wrong time? Did something not work out? And maybe, maybe, I mean, I know the market's done incredibly well this year, but you know, there's some stuff, sometimes it's legacy stuff that's floating around and you never know, you might be able to take some losses against some of those gains, reallocate, and you know, you might be in a better position going forward. Again, not necessary. It seems like you're in very good shape. Yoni, what is the amount of money that you spend, um, I mean, I know it's you both, but like if I'm looking at like your contribution to the couple, what do you think it is that you need in terms of expenses that we should keep in mind? I, uh, on average, over the over the course of the last couple of years, probably spend around 7000 a month for okay. me and all my contributions. That includes, you know, everything from splitting the grocery bill with my partner to you know, the things that I buy just for myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that does not include saving. That's just straight up. Like, yes. That's what you, okay. I got Those it. Those are my expenses. So w essentially your part-time freelance income is just on top of everything. I mean, you, you know, if you have $120,000 as a single guy, um, with, I'm sure you have this, you know, you have, I know you're capped at your um, state and local taxes, you know, because you are, um, subject to that old rule, but you know, you're basically your, your top bracket is around 22%. And so that it indicates to me that you're able to, you know, after putting money into your retirement account, you're living on your take home pay from your full-time job. And then that means that your, your part-time freelance is like extra money, extra cash flow, but you're using that to save a lot of money and you've saved a ton of money. You're in very good shape. Now that leads me to your question, which is, are you over saving? I don't know. You tell me, how safe is your job? Uh, well, I've lost jobs in the past, so which is why I've cultivated the other revenue streams mm -hmm. um, over the years, because you know I've, I've got come to feel like having one employer is the equivalent of having one client, mm. uh, and uh, it can... Uh, it it feels it has felt safe. I've been here over three and a half years now. It's it's a very large, uh, you know, corporate environment that I've never been in before, and it's quite massive. So it feels secure, but I mean, who knows? I know the future as well as the next guy. <laughs> right. So look, I think that then I'm not going to tell you that you're over saving. I think you're doing a great job. I think you know, essentially having seventy five grand in safe stuff, right? You're 55 plus the 20. I'm not including the, the other, you know, the other brokerage account, but that's like a good amount of money. 75 grand is probably where you should be. It really is because the world is weird. And I don't know if you look at maybe your, um, your partner's safe money and you put it together, you're probably good for six to 12 months. And that's kind of really as much as I could expect at a 34 year old. But I also want to be clear about the, the whole apartment thing that if like, if the blank hit the fan, the other thing to consider is like, if we make different choices, we have a lot of equity in our homes and, and we could certainly sell one and we could, you know, make different choices, but you seem to be in very good shape. I just noticed one little, a couple of things. One is the, maybe we look at the two brokerage accounts together and see if we can find some tax loss harvesting. The other thing is you said um, you have that traditional IRA that's still floating around. Yeah, and I've held on to it only because I'm nervous about the tax bill that would come if I, if I, you know. And there's no reason to, there's no reason to liquidate it, but you can move it into your current traditional retirement account, I think. You should find out from your employer if they'll accept a traditional IRA asset to flow into your, you know, because I know you said your employer is putting 8% into a traditional. Maybe you could just combine that and say, hey, I have an old IRA account. Can I roll it into the traditional part of our 401k? That's a question for your benefits people to see if they'll accept that. Interesting. I never heard of that before. Yeah. It's just a way to consolidate some of the money that you have. 
And then, and, and then of course, I want you to make sure you talk to your dad about the tax issue. And maybe you talk to your dad also about the idea of looking at whether or not there are some brokerage account losses to take. And then the last thing I will say is that, you know, you and your partner are getting married. So I think um, a little estate planning might be um, next up. Do you have any documents right now? I do. I need to get them notarized, but I also think it's time to revisit them given mm -hmm. the change. And I That's think right. I was hoping to do it with uh, a one fell swoop with like a prenuptial agreement as well. I don't know. Oh, look at you, a prenup. <laughs> I don't know if that's a thing, like to one one stop shop for people who are getting married to do their prenup and their estate tax. All well, time. I'm going to tell you two things that my experience is they're two different lawyers. The issue with a prenup is that is are do both of you agree that you should have a prenup? Uh, it's not a conversation we've explored in depth, but it, it's ref, it's come up conversations around like, well, if something were to happen, I want to make sure that. Oh, like my partner's mother is still alive and he definitely has expressed his wishes to make sure if something were to happen, some of his money would go to her. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, that's absolutely, you know, we could just all have, all we have to do is put it in writing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's for part of the estate. The prenup is a little bit different in that you would both need representation. My understanding of like real matrimonial law is that if you're going to do it, if there's a real inequity, both of you or each of you needs a lawyer to be able to go through the process. You know, you can talk about this with an estate attorney who's doing your estate, but it's usually not the same person. It is usually two different types of folks. Now, maybe you find someone else who can do it, but or maybe it's a very simple letter agreement which says whatever I come in with is mine, whatever you come in with is yours and N you know, we will not go after anything. Whatever you accumulate as a couple during the marriage um, is usually considered a marital asset. So it it is worth having a conversation if there's a real discrepancy between the two of you. Just think, Jill, if this whole thing goes to hell in a handbasket, they're going to be neighbors. Oh, my God. That's the worst case scenario. But like you, but it's it's fascinating. It's a fascinating setup. So. All right. So you got to get a couple things done. Talk to your dad. See how that goes. And let us know, because I'm interested to hear how that conversation goes and what you find out, because you would be that would be helpful for some of our listeners as well. I would say the only other thing I would do if, if I'm Yoni is, I, you know, there's two brokerage accounts, his real one and the other one with this 40,000 sitting in there. I, I, I would probably, you know, move that 40 into the main one. Can you do that, Yoni? Or is it because of the is there some reason why that's held separately? Um, it's held separately because they are these like two individual stocks and, uh, the brokerage account is with Betterment. And so all that, I, I haven't used it to trade individual stocks. So I'm kind of just holding them separately because it scratches my investor itch to be an active trader because I like to trade the covered call options with them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, no more than 40, though. And if you st and whatever you free up from there, if you like if you have some tax loss harvesting and you free up some, you take some of the gains on that account. Uh, I want to pinky swear that you're going to throw that money into the main brokerage account, really like the supplemental retirement account, essentially, is what the uh, what the betterment account should be. OK, for sure. I uh, try to target I have in my budget, my annual budgets or my monthly budget, this target of putting like. 33% between like savings, retirement and general investing. And I guess what prompted the question was like, oh, my savings rate at 12 and a half percent, I've reached like a good like nine months plus of, uh, you know, liquidity and emergency funds. Should I pair back on how much I ultimately put in and just increase yeah. how much I contribute to. Yeah. I mean, I think that you can think about maybe a, maybe accelerating the contribution to a Roth 401k or increasing the amount of money you put into your brokerage account. I think I'm more partial towards the Roth part, but you do what you need to do. Don't go crazy with that. The little scratching the itch of the managed stuff, because that can become a larger part of your overall. So let's make sure you keep that in check. And let us know how it goes with the estate planning and maybe a little matrimonial planning. So good luck to you, Mazel Tov, on your impending nuptials. If you have a big life event that is going on, give us a holler. Just go to JillOnMoney.com, click the Contact Us button. Let us know if you would like to come on the air by checking that box. 
Don't forget to sign up for the free weekly newsletter and you can subscribe to us on the Odyssey app or wherever you find your favorite podcast. Try to do something nice for someone else today. Be nice to each other, gang. It's going to be a very tense week. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.